Hello, everyone. Welcome to Man at the Library in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress. I am Ryan Reft. I am a historian in the Manuscript Division, where I oversee papers pertaining to 20th and 21st century domestic politics and policy. I am joined by my colleague, uh, Senior Archive Specialist Connie Cartledge, who has processed countless numbers of collections uh, related to domestic politics and policy, uh, including the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Papers, our most used congressional collection in the division, uh, the Harry Blackman Papers, one of our most used SCOTUS collections in the division, and one of what some may argue be the greatest journalist collection ever processed, the Anthony Lewis Papers. Uh, so she is here to join us to add her insights uh, into this conversation as well. And we are also joined by events liaison, uh, Elizabeth Shriver Byers, uh, who is producing the broadcast via Zoom and operating the Q&A. Today, obviously you were here to, because we are here to discuss uh, Birchers, how the John Birch Society radicalized the American right by Matthew Dalek. Who is Matthew Dalek? Uh, who is John Galt? Matthew Dalek is a historian and a professor in George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management. He is the author of three books on modern U.S. political history, and his writing has appeared in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Politico, Los Angeles Times, The Journal of Policy History, and many other popular and scholarly publications. His new book, Birchers, which you've already mentioned, actually just came out this week, so congratulations, Professor Dalek, uh, looks at the John Birch Society and its impact on national politics. Now, in writing the book, uh, Matthew, if I may, uh, utilized numerous collections from the Manuscript Division, uh, including the NAACP papers, which is actually one of our most used collections, period, uh, in the division, uh, the papers of Meet the Press co-founder, Lawrence E. Spivak, uh, Washington Post journalist, David S. Broder, who was processed by Connie Cartledge, and GOP consultant pollster, Arthur J. Finkelstein. So this just kind of makes Bershers a really great opportunity to discuss not only Matt Dalek's work and the history of this movement, but also the collections in the manuscript division, how they might speak to not only Dalek's research, but the research that other folks might bring to the division. And so with that, I'd like to hand over to Matt so that he can discuss in broad terms the book and other factors uh, pertaining to the Bershers. Great, uh, Ryan, uh, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Ryan, thanks, Connie, and Elizabeth for uh, uh, hosting this with me and being on this panel. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is just give a very brief overview of the Birch Society and, and some of the themes of the book and, and maybe go for eight, 10 minutes. Uh, and then, you know, we'll get into the Q&A. Uh, so, uh, okay, the Birchers. Um, a small band of anti-New Deal businessmen established the Birch Society in 1958. Uh, Robert Welch, the a candy uh, manufacturer, uh, and the other founders were rich, white, and almost uniformly Christian. Uh, the interesting thing about them, it, from my perspective, is that they combined mainstream associations with beliefs widely seen as fringe. Uh, three of them had served as president of the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, the premier uh, industrial uh, lobby group. Uh, one of the men was named Milwaukee Sentinel's Man of the Year in 1953 and led the YMCA. At the same time, their views occupied a spot on the edge of the political spectrum for the day. They regarded uh, as a group the growth of government in the first half of the 20th century, U.S. participation in World Wars I and II, and the unrelenting expansion of welfare programs as steps toward living under communist rule. So despite their wealth and status, they really were colossi uh, bestriding the world's most dynamic economy. Yet the men also shared a rage at what they considered a string of failures and deceptions that had brought the United States to its knees. They had a simple sounding goal. Their plan in forming the Birch Society, uh, which was by the way, named after an evangelist uh, turned warrior who was killed by Mao's uh, communist forces just after the end of World War II, their goal, their plan was to teach the masses about the internal communist threat to the United States. And by the mid-1960s, the group had recruited some 60,000 to 100,000 upwardly mobile, uh, mostly white, Christian, often suburban men and women who joined, typically joined a local 20 person uh, chapters so they could work within their community. 
Birchers held many beliefs, and I'll sum up just a few of them. So they rejected uh, virtually the entire post-World War II US-led international order. They urged the United States to get out of the United Nations. And, and actually, uh, I did a, a book talk at Politics and Prose on Tuesday night, and a very kind gentleman there brought a bunch of uh, paraphernalia to give to me, kind of props. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, you know, this is a bumper sticker, get the US out of the UN. Um, and they warned that of the greatest threat to the US uh, was political, media, and other elites. Uh, one Birch leader told a rally in 1974 that the nation's establishment had imposed planned shortages of consumer goods in the country and had to be brought to justice. Quote, we're going to take Nixon and Kissinger, McGovern, Fulbright, politicians of that sort, and we're going to try them for treason and they'll be hanged, he said. Newsmen, take that message and publicize it. The message they'll get is, the Americans are coming. And about 400 Birchers in the crowd gave him a standing ovation. At times, Birchers promoted a, a, a racist and anti-Semitic stereotypes. A brief example, uh, uh, to give you a sense of this, mem a member uh, named Ingrid Cowan reported that in her state, Mississippi, quote, the KKK is such a strong competitor to the society, at least when it comes to recruiting members. Birchers filtered, filtered a brand of single-minded anti-communists through the perceived needs of their towns and suburbs. More than uh, mainstream conservatives at the time, Birchers also trafficked in conspiracy theories. Uh, Florida in the drinking water, one of the, the most famous ones, one Bircher document warned, was, quote, a massive wedge for socialized medicine. Or, another brief example, quote, the peculiar cancer that killed former Senator Bob Taft may have been, Welch, the founder, wrote, quote, induced by a radium tube planted in the upholstery of his Senate seat, as has been so widely rumored. And again, you won't be able to uh, see this uh, very clearly, but uh, this kind gentleman who handed me these props gave me this sheet, and this is from one of the Birch Front Groups called Truth uh, About Civil Turmoil. And you have these charts that, again, you can't really make out, but the charts are actually fascinating because they break down elements of the conspiracy from the Bircher perspective. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment, um, the ACLU, there are NAACP, and there are all these arrows kind of pointing every which way. And it sort of illustrates the tentacles of the conspiracy as the Birchers saw it. Um, finally, Birchers defined freedom on their own terms. It was not access to the ballot box for all, nor was it freedom to act in accord with one's own precepts. And it certainly was not the freedom from want, as Franklin Roosevelt had defined it. Their conception of the Republic demanded the dismantling of the welfare state and dreamed of imposing their own version of Christian values on American schools and culture. How did these beliefs inform their actions? Briefly, okay. Uh, the society, and this is one of its, its insights and I think one of its, the source of its great appeal for a lot of people. The society enabled its members to fight the communist threat in the United States. It gave them a, a plan of action. And therefore was, quote, as one member said, the answer to every anti-communist prayer. Grassroots women birchers powered much of the movement and moved with speed in the early 1960s to make their presence felt. They formed front groups such as uh, uh, Impeach Earl Warren, you see it on this uh, postcard here, and support your local police. Birchers distributed flyers calling President John F. Kennedy a traitor, erected billboards, a smearing Martin Luther King as a communist, and pasted stickers on envelopes uh, that said, quote, we're a republic, not a democracy. The rank and file ran for seats on local school boards, promoted bans on supposedly communist, excuse me, teachings like sex education, and opened and operated bookstores and libraries. Now, at the time, virtues were widely regarded as unhinged. But the point I want to make is that I think they also brought underappreciated innovations to far-right politics. While Welch and other leaders promoted baseless conspiracy theories as fact, Birchers also understood how allegations of a plot against the United States 
could rally activists in opposition to a common foe and, and motivated citizens to get active in the struggle for power. Bircher showed future generations of far-right activists how mass mobilization around single issues could reap dividends far beyond the issue at hand. The society helped forge a coalition of super wealthy industrialists, upwardly mobile professionals, and some white working class conservatives and evangelicals. So you see the makings of a kind of cross-class alliance. That alliance would also benefit more mainstream conservatives like Reagan in 1980, but it also benefited the Birchers and, and the far right. And the society demonstrated how the far right appealed early on to a subset of voters and activists in every region of the United States, indicating a level of cross-sectional popular support for the far right. So you know, we tend to think of the Birchers as being very strong in the Sun Belt and, and in the South, and they were. But uh, I, was, I was struck by how much uh, uh, I gravitated towards all the activity happening in the Midwest, uh, uh, the Mountain West, and, and, and the Northeast as well. The group uh, exploded onto the scene when the news media reported that a uh, Welch had formed a secret anti-communist organization, and also that Welch had once accused Dwight Eisenhower of being a communist agent, sort of the most infamous conspiracy theory associated with the society. Um, and critics briefly, and this is relevant to the Library of Congress collections, which shed a lot of light on this, critics consider the society both uh, a twisted joke to be mocked and a serious threat to the nation's fledgling multiracial democracy. So uh, the liberal civil uh, liberties leader, uh, uh, Joe Rao, uh, fretted that Birchers were, quote, bent on destroying the very structure of democratic society. And that quote, I'm almost positive, comes from uh, the Joe Rao papers uh, in the Library of Congress. Birchers were called little old ladies in tennis shoes, pathetic, and most enduringly paranoid. They made inroad in, inroads into politics, electing some of their favorite candidates, winning a few legislative elections, and helping Goldwater, Barry Goldwater, win the 1964 presidential nomination. But over time, the attacks from, and I'll just kind of wrap up with a couple brief thoughts and then turn it uh, back to Ryan and Connie. Um, over time, the attacks from a coalition of Cold War liberals took a toll on the movement. So I devote an entire chapter of Birchers to the Anti-Defamation League's extensive counterintelligence operation to infiltrate and ultimately tarnish the society. Uh, there's also a really interesting story about how the mass media uh, both builds a society up, gives it a lot of prominence and notoriety, but also contains it and constrains it in a way that is obviously not really possible today in a much more fractured media landscape. Um, and then beyond these external pressures, the society also in the late 60s and early 70s really starts to implode from within. Uh, it had money problems, personality conflicts. And the conspiracy theories, I argue, attracted a lot more radicals to the ranks, some of them prone to violence and bigotry. Membership ultimately declined. And really, by the early mid-70s, the Birch Society essentially had become an epithet in public life and shriveled. Um, I'm going to wrap up there, but I just want to uh, uh, say one brief word about the Library of Congress before I turn it back over, which is that when I first went into the library in the archives, I did not, um, it didn't at first blush look to me like it was going to be this great font of information about this radical right organization, the Birch Society. But what I realized very quickly, and especially after uh, uh, incredible uh, help uh, from Ryan in particular and, and, and his colleagues, I realized that, you know, the library's collections are, they're not just so vast and so rich, but they encompass so many different aspects of American life. And there became a kind of organic quality to my research there into this Birchers and into the Birch Society. And what I found is that I could find the voices of Birchers in Library of Congress collections, the voices of conservatives who are not in the society, but sympathetic to them and also critical of them, the voices of liberal critics, uh, the voices of the press, and really these amazing archivists uh, like Ryan and Connie and their uh, uh, colleagues uh, helped me kind of navigate and really uh, gave me, I think, windows into the period and into a variety of perspectives about the Birch Society that I would not otherwise ever have had. So I'm really grateful uh, for all your help in, in producing the book, 
and also for hosting me uh, uh, this book event today. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you for the shout out. And uh, yes, I would agree. Our archivists are the best in the nation, undoubtedly. Uh, and we're going to bring, we're going to begin, uh, we're going to kick things off with a couple of questions and answers. Uh, just for the audience, uh, before we start, we're going to ask a couple of questions. There will be a QA and a uh, for you. So if you have questions, put those into the Q&A chat there, uh, and we will ask them uh, once we run through a couple of questions we have for Matt. And uh, Connie, you're going to start us off. Sure. Thank you for that great overview, Matthew. Uh, as you mentioned, you consulted the Joseph Rao papers, but you also conduct, uh, consulted about a half dozen other collections in the library's manuscript division, including, as Ryan mentioned earlier, Meet the Press host Lawrence Spivak, Washington Post reporter David S. Broder, anti-communist Herbert Philbrick, conservative pollster Arthur J. Finkelstein, civil liberties lawyer, as we said, Joseph Rao, and then the civil rights organization, the NAACP. Uh, did you have any favorite collections or uh, uncover any surprises, anything that surprised you when you conducted your research? Yeah, uh, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> so uh, yes, yes and yes. <laughs> the at least three of the collections I would say were uh, fascinating and 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 you know it's like among your children right you can't pick a favorite uh, there were there were three really critical ones so the Joseph Rao papers first of all there were just some great insights from Rao's perspective but in that collection I actually discovered I found just happened upon I think it was a letter from the research director of the Anti Defamation League to Joseph Rao or maybe. Maybe Joseph Rao was writing to the ADL research director, a guy named uh, Jerome Bax. And that turned me on to the ADL because they were writing about the Birch Society. And that led me down a whole different path where I emailed the ADL, I, I went to their offices, and then I discovered too that there's this incredible ADL collection about the Birch Society at the American Jewish Historical uh, Society in New York. And, and that single letter um, took me down just a whole different path and actually led to an, basically an entire chapter of the book. So the Rao collection was was instrumental. Spivak, I think, was actually amazing. And I don't know how, how often it's used, but when you get in there, so Robert Welch appeared on Meet the Press twice. And the beauty of the Spivak collection is that we have you have letters in there from people all over the country who were watching Welch on Meet the Press, and then responding basically in real time, not quite Twitter, but you know, 1961, almost incredible version of it. And, and what I liked about those letters, first of all, I think there were four folders that were just bulging at the seams, right? There were a lot of letters, double the amount for other uh, Spivak guests, which was uh, uh, really cool. But most of them were handwritten, or a lot of them were. And they did not seem like form letters. They seemed actually organic to the program. So what it allowed me to do is to kind of read a bunch of them and get a great sense of um, the anger and antipathy toward the mass media, even from, first of all, from some Birchers, but also from a lot of conservatives who said, you know, I'm not a member of the society. I don't necessarily agree with Welch and his Eisenhower theory, but you know, he strikes me as a patriotic American and you have kind of slandered him. And so it was interesting to see, you know, even non-Birchers, but, but sympathetic to them, suggesting that, well, you know, maybe the Birch Society had more support than even its numbers suggested. And then of course, the, the, the ways that people talked about the media uh, as kind of a witch hunting and, um, and eggheads and a lumping, you know, Spivak and others in with, with uh, Harvard and Harvard types. And you know, you, you get a visceral sense of, uh, of that antipathy coming through and you get some supportive letters as well. So I thought that was a really uh, incredible window. Um, a, a last collection I'll just mention briefly, which is uh, the Herbert uh, Philbrick papers. Um, I mean, he's a, a real a character, a, a prominent uh, anti-communist, but there's a memo in there and it's, it's actually a fairly, I think, well-known memo, but in which he attends a, a, an early meeting, recruitment meeting of the John Birch Society in May of 1959, so about six months after it was formed. And the incredible thing about this memo is that it is extraordinarily detailed. It's basically verbatim, and he's there to be recruited. He's someone who seems to be a great candidate, but he writes this memo, I think, to the FBI, 
in which he basically expresses his concerns that he thinks that, that this movement is kind of almost a proto-fascist movement that, you know, as he says, it, it uh, Welch's appeal uh, uh, echoes that made by Adolf Hitler, uh, that Welch's talk of using clubs to beat the opponents and, you know, using armies to go after their enemies, that he worried that that would lead to a kind of um, a street violence. And, um, and then later on, Philbrick actually becomes, he speaks out and kind of is in favor of the Birch Society. I don't know if he ever becomes a member, but, but it's just, again, it, you know, the, the papers, last thing I'll say is that the papers give you some really, not just incredible windows, but kind of the complexity of some of these debates. And those three collections that I mentioned all kind of, I felt like added texture, right, to, um, to a, the analysis, not just evidence, but also texture to the analysis and to get at maybe some of the, um, I think, interesting themes and debates at the time that a lot of, of individuals and groups were having in reaction to the formation of the movement. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so in your answer, it actually leads quite well to our second question. So as a writer, as a historian, as, a, as someone who works on, uh, in some level, political science, when you're dealing with all these voices in our collections, and you're also traveling to other repositories, as I know you use other repositories like the like ADL, like you mentioned, uh, how do you come to understand the voices that you're interacting with? Uh, and how do you come to create a narrative out of all those voices? Uh, particularly, like as you know, you've got support, you've got voices in, crit in being crit critical. Uh, and when you're dealing with a number of different archives too, how do you bring that all to play into a single narrative that at, on one hand uh, illuminates and amplifies those voices in a way that's useful, but also carries your narrative forward in a way that gets your point across clearly and concisely? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a great answer. I can just kind of give you a, a, a taste, I guess, of the process. So Part of it is, I think, I mean, the beauty of going to the archives, almost any archive, even if 10 people have looked at it in that year, you're probably going to discover new things. And what you're going to take out of any collection is going to be different from uh, the next person. The other thing is that once you're going into the archives and, you know, you're reading letters and memos, oftentimes themes become apparent. So just to give you an example, right, the Spivak collections, as I was talking about, those letters uh, created a theme about how conservatives reacted to watching an NBC program and how they felt about the media, what they thought about Welch and his conspiracy theory. Well, you know, that ended up being a couple pages in the book, right? And, um, and, and so as you go into a variety of collections as well, um, I try to get a, a, a variety of voices, right? Um, supporters of the movement, rank and file members, the leaders, variety of critics and many others in between. Um, and then also thinking about how institutions operate and react to it. And, um, and so those themes, as you kind of go work your way through these collections, you know, I try to sort of collate, I guess, my papers based on in part chronology and also by, uh, by theme thematically. And I think it's that combination that over the course, frankly, of a couple of years um, and and, and I should also just thank my, uh, my employer, George Washington University, which gave me a university facilitating fund that allowed me to uh, visit a lot of archives as well and do this kind of research. Um, and I felt like I got enough voices, enough perspectives. And of course, you can never get it all. Uh, you're always gonna have too much, but you start getting a sense of the themes that I wanted to uh, explore. And also, finally, I'll say, um, you know, reading the literature, and there's been a lot written about the Birch Society, but as you're exploring it, well, what is new, right? Like, what is different about what I'm discovering in these archives that I haven't seen anywhere else? The Spivak letters, again, to come back to that, I thought was new. The ADL piece, I thought was new. The, the, the voices of Birch women, other people have written about that, although, um, you know, I, I don't think quite as maybe systematically, you know, as I hope to do in this chapter on, on Birch women. And so, you know, you're also looking for, well, what, what are you going to add, right? What do you can contribute? How is this going to enhance your analysis? So 
it's a, it's, it's a messy process. I've made it sound a little simpler or neater than it is. It's really trial and error. There are obviously things that, you know, I would, I would have loved to have included like a whole chapter on maybe just the SPVAT letters. But of course, you know, you can't do that right in the, in the book. And, and that's why also a lot of historians end up, um, the stuff that gets put on the cutting room floor ends up maybe as a journal article or they write as an op-ed or something else, but, but then it's still valuable uh, at the end of the day. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks for that great answer. Uh, I have another question about how you used our collections. How did they help you illustrate not only the practices and political beliefs of the Birchers, but also their ability to capitalize on negative media attention? In fact, I think at one point you used the phrase, they were good at weaponizing their defeats. Yeah, um, so there are voices of, um, of Birchers, as I said, that come through. Um, you know, there's a letter, I don't think I even included it in the book from uh, Fred Koch, the, the, the patriarch of the Koch family. And he's writing, this is actually in the Eddie Rickenbacker papers at the Library of Congress, which didn't even, I think, make it into the book, but he's writing to Eddie Rickenbacker, trying to recruit a, a CEO of Eastern uh, Airlines, a, a, a major CEO to join, I believe it's the Birch National Council. And Koch um, is making a case, it's not a long letter, but he's making a really interesting case about what makes the Birch Society so special and how it provides this sort of grassroots action-oriented outlet that nobody else in the anti-communist right is doing. And Rickenbacker never ultimately joins the National Council, um, but it's interesting to see that kind of lobbying effort at work among fellow industrialists, fellow CEOs, and also how even those who didn't join could also lend their support. Uh, so you get a view in that collection, in the Philbrick papers, uh, in other collections um, of how some of maybe the leaders of the movement and not just leaders as well, because in Philbrick, for example, Philbrick at Welch, hey, there's this, um, this guy I know in New Hampshire who's really kind of A1 material you need to actually go talk to him because he could be a great recruiter for the society or he could be a section leader. And so, you know, you get a sense of how these networks are developed um, just by going into the archives and, and finding these voices, finding these, you know, insights, these nuggets that you wouldn't uh, otherwise have. The last thing I'll say is um, in terms of the, the Spivak papers, um, the letters to NBC to Spivak a lot of them were from Birchers, and a lot of them actually came from women. Um, a lot of, there were a number of people who said, after watching how you treated Welch, a good American, I've decided to join the Birch Society, or I sent them money right away. And so to answer your question, well, how did the Birchers weaponize defeat? Well, you know, Welch had a, a rough kind of go at Meet the Press, you know, the sort of hostile questioners. Um, but you do see as well how in almost real time viewers, at least some subset of viewers are reacting and saying, I don't agree with those press people. I actually agree with the Birch Society and I think they're a good group and I'm gonna send them money. And so even though it, Welch is kind of tarnished in some ways by, from a lot of viewers perspectives, there are a lot of others who are, who are splitting and saying, actually um, I'm now motivated. And so, you know, you get, you get that sense of how the society is able to uh, weaponize uh, uh, the criticism as well and kind of turn it in a way to their advantage. And then the, the last thing I'll say is that um, when the stories broke about uh, Welch and his conspiracy theory about Eisenhower, um, the society was very conscious that it, was, that, it, that it didn't want to lose members, right? It didn't want to hemorrhage. And what you can see is actually this avalanche of terrible publicity <laughs> but they're actually gaining members as a result, right? So there's maybe a handful of defections in Indiana and Illinois, but no one leaves in Wisconsin, something to that effect. Uh, and then they gain 50 new members here. And then there's a letter from 15 members in San Diego saying, we are with you, Bob Welch, more solidly than ever after the scurrilous attacks uh, that have been leveled uh, against you. And, um, and so you can get a sense of how those attacks cut in different directions, including 
buoying uh, the movement and giving it a kind of uh, force and energy and focus. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I think it's one of the more fascinating aspects, not only of the book, but of the period in general. So the role of women in the Birchers, which I think has been discussed, but I think it's not often something that people necessarily are aware of as much, but it's also something that one, um, Lisa McGurr and others have written about Orange County and how women, housewives particularly, were critical uh, in the development of the new right. But we also see it in the Chicano movement and the Black Power movement at the same time. Women, again, critical to the activism and the support of it. And yet, internally, in all, the, in all those movements, to some extent, uh, treated uh, in ways that we would find discriminatory today. Uh, how did you get at the voices, and you've mentioned this, but if you could discuss a little more, how did you get at the voices of women in the Bircher Society? Uh, and how did you kind of extract them and then kind of place them into, into this narrative to tell that story or that aspect of the story? Yeah, it's another really good question. So um, at Brown University, they have a special collection on the John Birch Society. And actually the, the archival story there is, is interesting. Apparently when the Birch Society was leaving its headquarters in Belmont, Massachusetts, a bunch of uh, uh, their archives were just put into a dumpster. And I don't know who, but someone basically claim them or took them out of the dumpster and gave them to Brown University. So they're, um, they're not, you know, it's, it's hit or miss, right? There are big gaps, but there are um, really valuable messages, basically letters from members all around the country over many years. And what I wanted to do is that because at the time and actually since then, Robert Welch and Fred Koch uh, uh, to some extent have been the sun, right? Like the sun around which the Birch Society has, has always revolved. They've really been the focus of, and, and Welch's writings and his, and his speeches have substituted in a sense for what the Birchers stood for, who they were. And I wanted to add to what a number of other historians have uh, done, including a, a very good book called Mothers of Conservatism, um, and bring in the voices of the rank and file. And what I discovered is that in those member messages, a lot of them at Brown, although not just at Brown and other collections, um, you can find a lot of women who are writing in. Now, you know, it's about every issue under the sun, right? But you do over time, again, you take a, a bunch of these, you get a sense of the things that, you know, are interesting to them or like are meaningful to them. And what I try to show in the book is that even though Welch had this sort of top-down approach, right, where he would write a, a, a bulletin, a, a bulletin in American opinion, write what he wanted his members to do, um, sometimes the members did that, but so, a lot of times they took what he was saying and, you know, maybe they just made it their own, right? They turned it into their own work within their own community. And so those voices, I think, come through in a really interesting way, especially on uh, issues of culture war, education, schools, gender, morality, sexuality. The other piece though, is that uh, at the archives at Brown, um, there are these employment records at the headquarters in Belmont. And the employment records are these detailed, sometimes, um, you get a, a sense of how the employees are sort of uh, assessed and treated. And one of the things I, I try to show in that uh, chapter and in the book is that the women in the Birch Society really powered a lot of the movement uh, at the grassroots, right, in their communities. But the headquarters, and, and it was not just true of the Birch Society, to be fair, right? It's in the 1960s. Um, you know, this is true of a lot of organizations, but it was a very patriarchal uh, kind of, and, and a lot of the, there are a lot of these employment records that really put down, in particular, the women and put them down, I think, in gender terms, like stop talking so much gets distracted easily. Um, and you can get a sense of, or, you know, um, did really terrible work and, you know, and, and stopped. I mean, it was really this kind of hectoring from almost exclusively male supervisors. Uh, and, and it, but it, it was interesting because it gave me a window, not just into the gender dynamic in headquarters, which I'd never seen before, uh, but, but also um, uh, how the pressures within headquarters uh, that were operating on them and how they kind of functioned 
as a, an organization, as a business. So, um, you know, it's something I tried to incorporate into the book. Thank you. Uh, from reading the book, it seemed like the Birchers had a great deal of animus toward President Richard Nixon. Uh, and even before that, when he ran for governor of California, uh, how did they respond to Watergate? Did it possibly confirm their worldview regarding corrupt government? Or did they perhaps, did they identify with the fervent dedication of individuals such as G. Gordon Liddy and Patrick Buchanan uh, towards Nixon's cause? Did they sort of see a parallel illustration of the sort of their own fervor that they extolled? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. So I don't do a whole lot really on Watergate in part because you know, the society by 1974 uh, has faded. Um, but a couple of things. One is that I think Birchers and other groups, as historian Catherine Olmsted has argued, uh, look at actual government conspiracies. And that allows conspiracy theorists to say, well, there are real conspiracies right, going on at the highest levels of government, including Watergate. And you know that just feeds, right? Feeds the, the theme, the idea that um, there are a lot of other conspiracies too. We just don't know about them. And so I think the, the, the real world, you know, as a kind of big picture thought in a sense, the real world conspiracy of Watergate uh, was uh, affirmation in a sense that, you know, of course the government is full of insiders committing these kind of conspiracies left and right, right? This sort of idea of a, I guess, a, a, a deep state. Um, but to get to your other point too, you know, the Birchers hated Nixon. I mean, certainly in 1962, they supported, uh, and this is well known, Joe Schell, who uh, was a Republican state uh, uh, assemblyman in, in California uh, when Nixon ran for governor of California and Shell challenged him. Um, and Nixon, in a way, because he came out actually quite strongly against the Birchers in 62, and then he suffered when he lost, he won the, the primary, but you know he was a former vice president and Joe Shell got about a third of the Republican primary vote, which was significant. And then Nixon went on to lose the general election um, I think a lot of Republicans looked at that and said, uh, at least at the time, if we go all out and really do a, a frontal attack on the Birch Society, um, we're going to pay a price. We're going to pay a price. And, you know, Reagan certainly four years later kind of walked a more careful line about it and a much more deft, politically deft uh, line. And, 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 you know, Nixon, I think generally, as, I, as that quote, frankly, you know, the, the Birch leader in 1974 is actually the most prominent African-American Bircher who was giving that speech in Denver to a rally of Birchers. Um, you know, they viewed Nixon, I think, and, and Rockefeller and people like Ford, Fulbright, again, he says politicians of that sort, um, and accusing them of, of conspiring essentially to impose this sort of shortage of planned goods, that they're part of this uh, uh, conspiracy to destroy U.S. sovereignty. And, and so, um, you know, they, they, I don't think they shed many tears when Nixon was uh, forced to resign. Thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, you know, full disclosure, Connie and I are Watergate fiends. So we always, we, and it's the 50th anniversary, so we have to ask about Nixon and of course, Watergate. So, uh, of course. Just a, Who is it? Now, Who we did have some- Watergate fiend? <laughs> Uh, fiend is the is the operative word when it comes to yes. Watergate. Um, so we did have some other questions, but actually the Q and A. There's some excellent questions in Q and A. So I'd, I'd like to kind of kick that off if that's all right. Um, and if I mispronounce your name in the Q and A, I apologize. Uh, Stefan Shivone Shivan asks, "What was the society's attitude to the anti-Semitism in its ranks? Was it more concerned about the optics or the harm it could do to Jewish Americans?" Mm. That's a, a really, that's a great question. And I've got a lot, <laughs> a lot in my book on, on that. Um, so the society always claimed that it was open to, to people of every religion. As long as you were religious, they said, we wanted you. They did have a handful of uh, Jewish uh, Americans who were uh, members of the, of the group. Um, but what I discovered, again, through all of these various archival sources, 
is that there was a lot of anti-Semitism within the ranks, but also at the top of the organization. You know, people like Ravillo, uh, Oliver, um, and, uh, and, and a number of, of others as well. And, um, and the society, I think, primarily was worried about um, this idea that it's critics, which sometimes charge like the ADL, that they are anti-Semitic or they harbor anti-Semites, they harbor racists. They were worried that that criticism would stick. And they got very upset and they were very rankled whenever someone accused them of that. And there were some efforts in headquarters to police their ranks, right? To kind of establish these boundaries and enforce them. So for example, there's a, a, a letter a uh, handwritten scrawling letter from this raving anti-Semite who uh, is a Birch member. And he's writing in, he's talking about Jewish plots and the like. And in headquarters, they, they, they're writing notes to each other on his letter. And they're saying, is this guy anti-Semitic or what? Question mark, exclamation point. Someone else writes in, he's a wild man. And then a third person, I think, writes, drop him. And, and so they did attempt to drop some, but but um, there are also a lot of times when um, you know, Oliver would go give a speech that was you know, anti-Semitic. He would accuse Israel of uh, sending LSD into the United States uh, or you know, talk in a mocking Jewish accent. And A, there were no repercussions, really. And uh, B, in some ways, you, know, you see the society kind of um, saying, whoa, you know, we've got a lot of anti-Semites. We may have a problem in this chapter. Uh, we'll investigate or we'll see, you know, we'll see if the members get off on this kind of thing, meaning like distributing the protocols of the learned uh, elders of Zion. So um, it was, uh, it was impossible, I think, for them to really police <laughs> their ranks. And I don't know that they really actually had the commitment to do it in any case. Part of it too, frankly, is that the conspiracy theorists attracted a lot of anti-Semites. Uh, and and so the conspiracies, like you actually see how the conspiracy theorists can attract people because they want to blame the Jews, right? And and there are other groups that they blame too, of course. Uh, but and and you know they had kind of files in uh, the Birch Society headquarters, uh, a file under anti-Semitism. Um, so you know this was a this was a significant uh, deal. And, um, and, you know, generally they were unsuccessful, I think, at, at uh, you know, getting it out of their ranks. And, and frankly, the ADL uncovered so many examples of anti-Semitism, people, pra Birchers praising Hitler, that kind of thing, that, um, you know, I don't know that they really actually wanted to, because they, they drew energy from that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it seems like they really... Uh... <laughs> It seems like a, a very uh, sticky issue for them uh, on both and cutting both ways. Uh, our next question is from Sarah Duke, who's actually a colleague. Uh, you probably know Sarah. Uh, yes, uh, Sa I, thank her, I thank her in the acknowledgments as well. Sarah is one of our best curators in the library. She works she in Princeton Photograph. Yeah, uh, she's helped me numerous times at the library. Yes. She's, a, she's a treasure. Uh, Sarah uh, oversees the cartoons in the Princeton Photographs Division, among other duties. And she asks, I know you use the editorial cartoons of Washington Post cartoonist Herb Block to illustrate your book. Did you find conservative cartoonists who commented on the society either positively or critically? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, I don't recall any conservative cartoonists. Um, you know, it, it would be interesting to see. I don't even know, you know, who they were, although I'm sure they existed. Uh, and I don't recall those in, uh, coming across uh, other than, other than I should say, there were in some Birch publications, cartoons. Now I don't know who, who drew them because you know they weren't as well known as her block. But the vast majority of cartoons that I came across were really kind of what I've expected, which is that um, political cartoons with a biting edge that suggested the Birch Society was extremist, anti-democratic. It was in bed with the KKK. You know, very critical. Um, but in the again, in the Birch Society and other kind of publications that were aligned with it or sympathetic to it, um, you do come across some, um, you know, supportive. I'm trying to think of examples, but supportive uh, uh, cartoons that, you know, I think get at themes of Americanism, right? They're true patriots. They're um, they're martyrs, 
uh, and um, and trying to kind of push back on. And of course, you know, the society very effectively used, um, I guess what I'd say is iconography, right? The impeach Earl Warren uh, 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 billboards and again, and, and postcards, um, the bumper stickers that became kind of ubiquitous um, and that people saw kind of driving around. Uh, there was a controversy about um, uh, uh, in Tennessee about a birch leader who on all of his mail put us a, a stickers. Well, on his, yeah, stickers, uh, uh, we're a republic, not a democracy. Let's keep it that way, which was a birch a slogan as well, excuse me. And so um, you see how they use, you know, not necessarily cartoons, but uh, the kind of communication tools of their day. And, and these were shorthand, but, but people knew, a lot of people, especially sympathetic ones, knew what it meant, and it was a kind of rallying cry. So, um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't come across many conservative uh, uh, cartoonists. Yeah, and I find that Herb Block was so influential and kind of really good at what he did that uh, he kind of sucks up a lot of the air uh, in that field, uh, you know, for better or for worse. Yeah, uh, but yeah. it's also because he was just excellent at what he did. Uh, yeah. So there's a very there's a very straightforward question. Uh, from anonymous attendee, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, okay. How was the John Birch Society funded? Ah, good question. So it was a dues-paying membership model. So the members, uh, the men, were required to pay twenty-four dollars a year. Women, twelve dollars a year. Um, I think because they, the Birchers leaders, assumed the men had more money. Um, a lot of times there were husband and wife teams that both joined, so they paid $36. There were also lifetime members. So I think if, if someone, I think it was $1,000, I'm not 100% not sure, uh, but a certain amount of money would, you would become a member for life and you would also be entitled to all the Birch magazines and all the other offers uh, that the society had, like special deals on books, for example. Um, there was also though a business side uh, that was uh, important to the group, which is that, you know, they had a publishing arm, Western Islands uh, a publication. Um, they had uh, libraries, mobile uh, bookstores that they set up and bookstores. Uh, and they had a whole bookstore program. And uh, I believe they were able to make some money off, off the business concern and they wanted to run it like a business. And then of course they had very well off donors. So um, the ADL actually has uh, in uh, the collection that I mentioned earlier in New York, there is a codicil to a will of uh, a Birch donor in which she says, she's very wealthy, I think, and she says, you know, upon my death in this codicil, uh, I, I want to bequeath, you know, the rest of my money or X amount of money to, uh, to the society. And so, or for example, uh, Harry Bradley and, and a couple of his colleagues, and Harry Bradley was uh, sort of the major industrialist in the Milwaukee area uh, and, and very supportive of the Birchers. Uh, at one point, Bradley and one or two of his colleagues uh, pledged to put up what I think was $25,000 so that Robert Welch and the society could uh, turn out a, a film. Right, a, a film or kind of pro high production value for for its time, um, and so, you know, because there were a lot of very wealthy people who who belonged, and also really the the leaders and founders, um, or just a last example really is that um, at one point the Birch leaders and National Council were very worried that Welch was working the the basically the founder and, and the leader of the site. He was working way too hard. They thought. And so they pooled their resources together and raised hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars to get him a secretary. Said, you know, you have to have a secretary and we're going to pull our money together to get it for you. So, you know, you can see the kind of different mm -hmm. funding streams. Um, the Birchers never, of course, you know, put this out and there are different estimates about uh, the funding, but they were quite well off, uh, I, I think, for a while. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, and use that money pretty effectively to take out ads and newspapers and, and do all sorts of other uh, uh, activities. And, and they have paid employees as well. I 
Thanks, Matt. Uh, Connie, do you want to ask one of the questions? Uh, we have a question from Rick Allen. He asked, what caused the Birch Society to fade and lose steam in the public discourse? Was there one event, one leader's death? What was the beginning of their descent? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really, uh, a really interesting question. Um, so I, I don't think there's one single moment, right? There's no kind of um, moment where the Birchers are somehow defeated or contained. Um, what I do argue, though, is that so post Goldwater, the Goldwater election, they are they're still robust. They still have uh, many members. Um, but by the late 1960s, the society had been in the news for a number of years. Um, the the threat of a radical takeover of the Republican Party that a lot, of, a lot of liberals at the time worried about seemed, at least to a lot of liberals, seemed to have receded somewhat, maybe not entirely, but somewhat from the height of the, of the kind of Goldwater uh, boom. And, um, and, you know, and I think the press got a little tired of covering the Birchers. Um, you know, they had a kind of shelf life. And, um, and the Birchers themselves, I think, became more radical. You know, as I said in my opening remarks, um, they uh, they attracted even more and more conspiracy theorists. They had a lot of internal dissent. You know, there are a lot of uh, struggles within chapters or one chapter squabbling with another chapter. At one point in, I think, 1966, the New York Times reports that Welch had to go around the country trying to uh, quell a lot of these internal chapter disturbances. Uh, and so you see the kind of fractured uh, nature of such a group as well and how it can wear on the group. And then um, the money, you know, members have to, they resign, some were kicked out. Uh, you know, it was, I don't know if it was ever really a super sustainable <laughs> kind of uh, long-term model. Um, and then of course, uh, it's not that communism fades, of course it doesn't, um, but, you know, by the time you get to the 70s and, and detente, right, communism seems to be less, and, and also the end of the Vietnam War, um, it seems to be less of a major threat than, say, in 1958 or 1960. And that, I think, saps some of their energy as well. Um, and then, you know, final thing I would say is that, as I mentioned earlier, the ADL the NAACP, right, with collections at, at the Library of Congress, which are also an uh, incredible resource. Uh, the Americans for Democratic Action, a, a union-backed uh, group research, Inc., which uh, was a tracker of the Birchers and other uh, members of the radical right. Um, and a lot of politicians and political leaders as well. I think that it took a toll on the movement, right? It was sort of became synonymous. And so, you know, the last thing I'll say is that in 72, I think it was, uh, when William Rehnquist was nominated to the Supreme Court, there were accusations that he had been a member of the Birch Society in Arizona. And there were a couple of uh, liberal leaders who testified to that, uh, or testified saying, you know, we think that there's legitimacy to this. And Rehnquist, you know, said, there's nothing to it. I've never been a member, nor would I be. Um, and uh, Ted Kennedy actually came to, Ted Kennedy, of course, the famous liberal lion of the Senate from Massachusetts, came to Rehnquist's aid and said, in a sense, to liberals, uh, uh, like Joseph Rao, I think, was one who testified and said, you know, you shouldn't be smearing Rehnquist like this. Um, you shouldn't be kind of, you know, associating him with Bircher's. I mean, Bircher became, came, it was such an epithet at that point. And, um, and it's, again, organizations still exist, but you know, by then I think its its impact had really uh, faded, and one of the things I trace in the book is how its ideas and tactics uh, uh, lived on, but but the organization itself uh, really, as I said, shriveled. So we only we have five minutes left. We've got two questions, but I think I can combine them <laughs> into one, and that you can right. take a shot at it, and we can close on this. And uh, I would just say for the audience, great questions. Um, those are all really substantive and interesting. Uh, so uh, really yeah. appreciate uh, you guys putting these in. So Teresa Morales asked, and there's an anonymous attendee as a second question, so I'm going to combine them. Can you talk a little bit more about the historical antecedents of the JBS and how it fits into the broader theme of American conservatism, and perhaps 
um, this relating to the second part of the question, uh, perhaps you could do so by describing their relationship to civil rights and black power movements in the context of that answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the antecedents, though. So, yeah. And look, there are a lot of historians who have done really interesting work about uh, uh, sort of the, the long conservative movement or the long right uh, uh, through the 20th century. Um, certainly, a lot of Birchers, uh, a lot of members, a lot of the leaders uh, took inspiration from Joseph McCarthy and Bob Taft, the Ohio uh, senator. And, um, and I, a lot of the leaders certainly saw the, um, the takedown of Joe McCarthy, what they saw as really the, the neutering of him uh, and the censure in the Senate uh, in 1954 as a blow to a kind of true, you know, Americanist effort to root out a communist within the government, within society. Similarly with Bob Taft, I mean, Welch, I think, called when Eisenhower won the Republican nomination in 1952, uh, uh, Robert Welch said, and Taft lost that nomination, he called it the dirtiest deal in American political history, essentially. Um, so those were, I think, important kind of immediate antecedents. Going back further, though, uh, America First, the anti-interventionist movement of the 1930s. And, and I talk a little bit about this in the book as well, but there were a lot of um, movements, of course, in uh, the 1910s and the 1920s, many of them led by women, uh, that, of course, you know, the old right, uh, so isolationist, a lot of them were anti-immigrant, um, a lot of them were uh, a concern about loosening morals, right? A kind of collapse of, uh, uh, of social mores and uh, uh, we're trying to police in a sense, uh, alcohol consumption, um, uh, issues around sexuality, gender roles. And so, you know, there's really a, a, a deep history uh, in a sense. And I, again, I try to touch on, uh, on that and and then the other part, so Ryan, you asked about um, uh, the Black Power Movement or civil rights, is that right? Uh, yeah, both, yep. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if I'm answering the person's question exactly, but certainly um, the Birch Society, so the Birch Society said, look, you know, we're not racist, you know, we're, we're not opposed to integration. Um, but the, the challenge was, the problem was that they erected billboards, for example, in the South especially, um, that uh, had a picture of Martin Luther King at what they said was a communist training school. And they said, you know, he's a communist. And, and they basically said the civil rights movement is, you know, there was a, the, one of the most prominent African-American speakers of the society, Lola Bell Holmes, uh, would, would go around giving speeches. And the title, I think, of one of her talks was, um, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but is the Kremlin in control of the civil rights movement? And you know, the problem with that, of course, is that, you know, of course, the answer, of course, in reality, no, it was not a, you know, it was a, a, a grassroots, genuine effort for uh, among African Americans and obviously some white Americans uh, uh, to end segregation and to achieve civil rights and, and social equality. Um, and and so, but it's no accident, of course, that the Birch Society is in part, I think, energized at the same time that the civil rights movement is really taking off or becoming a major, I mean, you know, the, the Birch Society, I think, derives energy from in part this idea. And that's also the Earl Warren story as well. You know, why do they want to impeach Earl Warren? It's not just about race, and it's not just about the 54 Brown versus Board of Education decision. But it is in part about that, I think, because the Birchers argued that these nine justices, there's a book called Nine Men Against America, that was a big, you know, popular Birch book. Um, and uh, basically that these justices are unappointed, they're communistic, at least in their thinking, right, is the argument, and that they have basically are trampling on the Constitution by, you know, using federal power to tell states what they can or can't do. And that was, you know, their argument is it was nowhere in the constitution. It's really up to, you know, and you're trampling on the rights of minorities, meaning like the minorities in the states, whites, 
minority rights to discriminate, basically. I mean, that's the logic of the argument. So they really, um, I think they got a lot of energy out of these. And, you know, the other thing I'll say is that, of course, there were a number of associations, as I implied. So, for example, Tom Anderson, who was one of the leaders and a spokesperson for the Birchers, you know, at one point he gives a radio address in which he praises the apartheid regime in South Africa. Um, and uh, and so it's just, you know, to give you a taste of uh, of this dynamic. And um, and anyways, I, I would just say that uh, they certainly, um, you know, saw themselves as kind of holding the line against civil rights, fighting what they saw as a communistic conspiracy against black power. Thank you, Matt. That was a great way to finish. Uh, we appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us about your book. We definitely appreciate you coming to the library using our collections. And to all the folks watching, come down, use our collections. That's why we're here. We're not here to be cloistered. We're here to be used. Uh, and uh, Matt, uh, we appreciate you using our collections in this book and wish you the best of luck with it moving forward. Thank you so much. And, and I just want to say thank you again. I mean, the Connie and Ryan, um, you know, uh, you guys are so generous to host this, but also, you know, I, you could, I could not have written this book, frankly, without archivists like you. There's just no way. And, um, and you know, I try to acknowledge that in the acknowledgements, but I just wanted to also say it here because, you know, there's no way to do a kind of 21 collections, you know, and, and, and to access these, these kind of incredible documents without the people who are acquiring them, who are maintaining them, who know them, who are able to kind of help you figure them out. Um, and, you know, I really felt like you and your colleagues went above and beyond. And, you know, that's why I think the Library of Congress is really uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest uh, uh, archival collection really in the United States. So thank you again. It's really an honor for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that, Matt. And thank you for everyone for attending. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.